Welcome to another episode of We Don't Die. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the best-selling book called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. Our guest today is Hans Wilhelm, who has written and illustrated over 200 books for all ages, with a total of over 42 million copies sold in 30 languages. With his life-affirming concepts, he has inspired audiences around the world to connect with their own inner wisdom. Hans also uses his writing and illustrating talents to explain complicated spiritual laws and concepts in short and free videos in a very unique and simple way. Videos are on topics like love, fear, grief, death, reincarnation, gratefulness, and he even has a video called 10 Surprises When You Die. This back of a napkin approach seems to be very appealing as his YouTube channel has now well over 50,000 subscribers. You can visit his websites either at hanswilhelm.com or lifeexplained.com. Hans Wilhelm, welcome to We Don't Die Radio. Thank you so much, uh, Sandra. I'm delighted and excited to be on your show. Oh, and I'm delighted as well. I got hooked on your YouTube channel, and I was watching one video after another after another, and they're so powerful and so wonderful. So thank you for all the giving you do to help impact people and help them with their lives. Thank you very much. Yeah, I appreciate that. It uh, just seemed to be working, and it's taking off uh, like crazy at the moment. I see the... the, the the numbers of viewers and so on. I'm quite surprised. I just humbly shared the little understanding I have of the spiritual world, which is the result of 50 years study of various different spiritual paths and uh, put them together because I feel I have, uh, as an illustrator and writer, uh, the talent of uh, illustrating it. You sure it, do. It's, anyway, it's just a sort of what I enjoy. And lifeexplained.com is also a website, lifeexplained.com or lifeexplained.com on the video channel on, on YouTube. Yes, and just for our listener uh, or viewer, just beneath this episode in the description, there are links to um, hanswilhelm.com and lifeexplained.com and to the YouTube channel, so you can easily go and and Thank see you. all of that. You're welcome. So if you wouldn't mind, tell us a little bit about you and maybe how your story began, where you're from, even how you got into artwork. And <laughs> yeah, and then... Definitely, we want to talk about life after death and what you're up to. But give us a little story about you. Well, as you can hear from my accent, I was uh, born in Germany. I grew up there and uh, left it uh, when I was a teenager. I lived in Africa for many years because I liked the sunshine. And uh, eventually, after two years traveling around the world, landed up here in America and lived here ever since and changed my career here in, to become a writer and illustrator of children's books, which took off also very well, and I'm very delighted. It's a very rewarding kind of career. Now, all the time over the 50 years, particularly as a teenager, I was always interested in the spiritual side. I couldn't believe what the churches were telling us. It didn't make sense for me. But at that time, there was no Google, there was no Internet and so on, and there were very few, if any, books. So searching uh, out this material was very difficult. So I, of course, started like many at my age with uh, transcendental meditation when I was 18 or something. And then step by step came uh, people like Edgar Casey and so on and many, many others. And I studied a lot and I found truth in it by, by applying many of the laws of the kind of, uh, yeah, laws, I would say. In my own life, I realized that there is truth in all of these. So... Um, I kept this more or less to myself because I always believed if I have to teach it or preach it, then I don't believe it myself. <laughs> a, a master who really believes in this stuff doesn't talk about a thing. That's what I understood so far. It says you do not talk about anything that you know. You only talk about the stuff you do not know. Interesting. I was very grateful for all the teachers, like friends and Edgar Casey and others and so on, who, in spite of being uh, uh, knowing the material and having it virtually really uh, in uh, living it, uh, they still shared it. They were not perfect either. And I understood now that you don't walk your talk, you limp your talk. So all the people who we uh, admire, in particularly in the New Age movement and so on, they all have their little uh, their, their shortcomings as well. They are not perfect. Yes. And thank God they share the material that they have discovered or what they have given to them. So, but I never thought I would do that. And then it was a 2004 when my father died. 
And my father did not believe in life after death. He was very sure about it. He was a soldier in the Second World War, and he has seen so much death, and he says there is nothing happening after death. And he was quite happy with it. He was quite content. He was going to die, and it's okay with him. Although um, we, we four children, we took turns being with him during the last few days. And it, when it was my turn one day, I said to him, you know, I respect that you believe after this death there is nothing there, there is no consciousness on you. But um, let me tell you, just in case uh, you may still continue with the consciousness of, or life, this, these are the things which you most likely will experience if life continues after death. So I told him, let's say, 10 or 12 points which um, you most likely experience when you die. And he couldn't speak at that time anymore, but he smiled a little bit at the end and says, yeah, that's your belief, I have mine, and so on. So he died soon after. I totally forgot about this. And it was only five years later, four years later, when I heard about a very well-known young um, medium who communicated with the dead. And I didn't want to do any communication with the dead, but I wanted to meet that person. Sure. And his name is uh, Roland Comtoy. Have you ever had Roland, Roland on your show? No, I've not heard that name before. Oh, I will give you the link. He's, he's okay. quite interesting. Anyway, so I, he was going to uh, release, he was releasing a book uh, in the neighborhood and I went to the local uh, New Age store and uh, to uh, be at his readings, and I, w I was, was sure that I wanted to get a seat, so I came very early, I sat down, tried to do meditation, and suddenly somebody tapped me on the shoulder, and, that, and he said, my name is Roland Comtroy, I saw you coming in, and the moment you came in, your father came in here as well, and came to me and says, look, this is my son, and you have to go to him, you have to tell him that whatever he told me about what happened after death came true, and I am ever so grateful for him having told me this because it helped me so much to, to get my bearings over on the other side. Wow. And uh, then and he also said, would, he, would, he, would I write, please, uh, books about this as well? Because he sees a lot of souls arriving on the other side, totally confused, don't know what's happening, and so on. And then he, uh, Roland also shared some other personal things from my father, which I knew then that it was my father, truly. Anyway, so I left. I was totally surprised. I was not really willing to share all my spiritual stuff with the world. And I says, how do I do this? Writing books with spiritual matters is limited. You are very successful, Sandra, I like to add here. You have done fantastic with your book. And uh, as you know, it is pretty rare. A lot of people write spiritual books, but you had a, a, a rocket success with your book. Uh, well deserving, oh, but it, it's not the norm. It's not the norm. Um, because the reading of books uh, is not any more that uh, as it was uh, 20, 30 years ago. Right. Right? So people want the videos or whatever. <laughs> they want fast, short fast. and fast. <laughs> so I thought, I remembered my own time when I was a teenager, I says, I, and, and I, would, I don't know what, what, where to go. I says, today they want videos, as I say, short videos. And so I says, let me illustrate, because this is sort of one of my talent, of how the spiritual laws work, because I'm a visual person. If I buy a bookshelf from Ikea, I don't know whether they still sell bookshelves, but to put it together, then I can't go by reading the description, put the thing on it. I have to see it visually to put the pieces together. And this is exactly what I do in my video series, lifeexplained.com. I draw of how all these different uh, dynamics are worked together, how karma works, where it is stored, how it comes back to us, etc. And when one sees it visually, it becomes much clearer. I do this also for myself, because once I do this whole graphic design there, it says, oh, this makes total sense. And uh, it helps me as well to understand, and I think a uh, uh, thousand of other people as well, so I'm very happy about this. And this is how the series started, and I should slowly expand it and which started only maybe with a handful of uh, videos. It's now over 60 videos. And that's how I shared it. And uh, that's that story. <laughs> oh, I love it. And like you say, there's a back of a napkin approach for our listener. If you can just imagine, because you, you hear Hans talking in the video, but then you see what he's drawing on. And he's got his markers and he's talking about something. And then, you know, he's he's drawing a picture of it. And then it's just fantastic. So you're watching him, you know, draw. You're watching his artwork and he's telling the story of whatever it's about, reincarnation or karma or courage or whatever that may be. And they're short. They're yeah, several minutes long, but they're so engaging. 
And I'm a visual person too, that it's great. I, you know, I like hearing things, but if I can also see it, that's wonderful. But they're really captivating and quite unique. And I've never seen anything like it. And especially talking about the spiritual laws. Yeah, because there is so much. And when you uh, read the writing of uh, Edgar Casey or even Rudolf Stein or any of these uh, um, sort of writers who wrote maybe 100 years ago their books, they are very complicated. You really have to read the sentence three, four, five times before you get it. And there are very few, only new people who write very clearly and very, and so you have to sort of work yourself through the material and put it all together. So therefore I like the simplicity, a simple approach. I think simplicity, what, what does Leonardo Vinci say? Simplicity is the sophistication or something like the highest sophistication. And I think also God is, if we, although I will not uh, imagine that I know, I cannot describe God, but there is a simplicity in God. God is very direct, very clear. There are not all these mysteries. Our church always speaks, this is a mystery of God. No, everything that happens here on the world is clearly a result of something before. There are no mysteries really for us if we really want to be open. Everything makes sense once we understand the old Christian teaching of reincarnation. Remember, Christ did teach reincarnation. The first 400 years of the church were always with reincarnation or the early church fathers. It was only in the fifth century when King, uh, when Emperor Justinian the first, who considered himself the, uh, the head of the church at that time, banned the teaching of reincarnation of that the soul existed before, uh, before birth. I didn't and know that. Oh, yeah. I made a video on that one, and it's a very uh, eye-opening video. It's uh, Reincarnation Part 2, where I draw all the dynamics and all the elements which made this change in the church. And then suddenly the church didn't know how to explain things, didn't know where do we come from, where do we go, death, etc. They made things up like hellfire and stuff like this, which none of it is in the Bible. But they created a lot of stuff around which didn't exist. So when you go today to the average priest and says, no, here's my, my, my partner is dead. Where is he gone? Well, we don't know or whatever. You get some, some sanctimonious comments. It's a mystery of God, why it happened or why you have got cancer or why you are sick. No. It's all very clear results, one after the other. And Christ, and they are very clear, and um, Matthew and so on, very clear sentences when Christ asks his disciples who they say I am. And they say, well, they think you are Isaiah reincarnated or whatever. It's very clearly in there. But it is not taught in the churches. And, and at least I'm speaking about the traditional yes. uh, churches we have, whether Catholic or Lutheran or whatever it is. And that's very, very unfortunate because... It's all very well to know that the person we love still continues to live on the other side. But it is much more helpful to see the much bigger picture. Why were we together in this lifetime? What was our purpose? Where we come from? Where are we going? And very often the souls who have departed and speak then through medium back to us and are not necessarily on a very high level of awareness and consciousness. They can only speak from their little perspective. And rarely are they necessarily brighter or more intelligent only because they are dead. They have got this right. <laughs> That's one of the surprises when you die, because I think a lot of people think uh, when we cross over, transition, we become this all-knowing person. And many people consult mediums and want to have answers for their lives. And their relatives might not be able to give them their answers because they're still them. They can give an opinion, but it might not be the all-knowing truth. That's absolutely true, Sandra. Yeah, this is something which people forget. And uh, I personally am a bit hesitant to even recommend connecting again with your uh, uh, loved one who has died. I can understand the sorrow and I can understand the pain and it, and the loss a person goes through. And it may be only too natural to want to do that. I fully understand. But it does, it, there are risks in this kind of enterprise. And I am therefore never recommending doing it. And uh, that because there are other entities as well around. And whenever we open ourselves up in this kind of Totally, oh, I want to hear, I want to hear. Who knows who is coming in, through the medium or even through you? And there is some danger. There are negative entities who just lure and wait for the moment to come 
uh, and, and, and suck our energy. And I, I really am aware of it. I did make a video on um, spirit possessions, and this is a very, very serious matter. And it is far more popular, not popular, far more uh, frequent than we uh, like to think. Um, and when we dabble with all the medium things and so on, we are we are going to borderline of, of where others can jump in as well. We're opening ourselves up to areas where maybe we shouldn't. But I'm leaving, of course, to everybody else to make their own choices. I personally would not recommend it anymore. Hmm. Yeah, there's certainly um, quite a conversation in that world. There's people that have practiced mediums and through many churches who, with love and with intent and with blessing, and they've never had a negative experience. And then there's also people, you know, that do, you know, surround it with a white light, the, the communication. And I think, personally, it's not a bad thing to consult a medium for that comfort that your loved one goes on. However, it's not something where you become addicted to it and you keep that conversation. It's a nice comforting thing but then I like to say okay now you know we go on your loved one's gone on who are you what is your life for and how do you make your most you know make your life worthwhile I mean do you have thoughts Hans about the purpose of life while why we're here <laughs> I know you do but <laughs> and I'm sure you have a video <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting to talk about because if we don't die no, What's the point of this? Well, I just released another video today, of course, which which explains today, yay! <laughs> yeah, this morning. Um, it's uh, basically it says of uh, how originally we. It speaks about creation, about how uh, the whole creation came into existence through vibration, and at a very very early time, at that vibration, um, some of the uh, spirit beings, we call angel or whatever it is. Um, just sort of really revolted and wanted their own uh, creation, which is in the Bible called the Fall, led by Lucifer or Satana. And they um, pulled a lot of other spirit being with them out far away from the pure heaven, from creation, and into, to create their own world. And this is where we are still today. This is where Earth is sort of one of these in the material universe, which is far away from the highest vibration, which is love and unity. Although it's all vibrational, it's nothing different. Um, but you have to see the video to really grasp it, how it works. But what is basically is that we really, on our own accord, we have left what we call the pure heaven or home or the state with God or the bliss where we originally came from. And now we are here it's exactly like the story of the prodigal son. We left our home on our own accord. And it says, give me your inherit my inheritance and let me go. And we went out. And here on earth, we have really sort of uh, screwed it up a little bit. We got totally involved into the five senses and yes. the pleasures of the five senses. Yes. And um, et cetera. Eventually, we have to get out of it again and come back. And this is the whole reason of my series, to explain the various way how we come back. And this can only happen with the cycle of reincarnation. We come to this planet Earth, and then we, we go back to our spiritual, uh, temporary spiritual world until we really of get of such high vibration that we will be pulled back into the pure heaven. But at the moment, our vibrations are, are very, very low, which we have done. We have really given away our, our energies in, in so many ways. And um, we have to really regain it again and get stronger. And we can only do this by undoing our karma, which is usually through forgiveness, asking for forgiveness, love and service, and growing through that and getting in a higher and higher slow vibration. And there isn't much secret about it. It's actually very, very simple when you understand it. And there isn't even much guessing about it because we can all check this. I mean, you, you know about all the Dolores Cannon and so on, the, the mayor the therapists who do past life regression and so on. It's all the same thing, and we do near-death experience and so on. There is no secret about this whole thing. What is most people in the Western world are not aware is the repeated life here on Earth. And this is not punishment. This is not bad. This is actually a tremendous blessing for us to be here on Earth. 
when we are here on Earth for an average of 800,000 hours, which is very, very short, <laughs> particularly when you get older, 800,000 hours. Yes. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> and, and we sleep one third of those hours. <laughs> and it is just like going to college or kindergarten, maybe because we are not that high, but going to college for a short time. In college, we are here to learn. And when we want to learn, whatever we want to learn, we need challenges. And these challenges, we knew, by the way, before we incarnated, uh, are, can be very, very tough. They can be very dramatic. We can lose our home, our job, our health, etc., etc. But all these are tasks which we ourselves have set up prior our birth to face and to overcome and to become stronger. Like a sportsman has to really train his body to become stronger and stronger. They need the hurdles to become stronger and stronger. And we do the same thing here on life. So all the disasters which we experience personally as well as collectively are nothing there but challenging or karma coming back to us to clean up. Like an illness is nothing else than a flowing out of karma. That does not mean we shouldn't stop it and to try to prevent anything or just come to a hold and change it. But it is everything. And even if the disaster we have otherwise, the blue of fates are all in a way karma and they are there for us to become stronger. That what doesn't break us makes us stronger. And not only stronger as, as uh, from the ego point, but from the love point, stronger in love and becoming more loving and becoming more compassionate. And all this is here. And we only do it for a very, very short time. But we think once we are here, this is all there is. We only have this life here. Yes. This is nothing else. And this limits our whole perspective and also limits how we interact with other people. Hmm. It, it's all, I had a great question I was going to ask you, then I, I was so engaged in what you were saying, I forgot. <laughs> oh, yes, I know what it was. I know many parents whose children have uh, passed away at young ages. Is that all part of it? Do these children know ahead of time that I'm going to be here for three months or three years and are there like contracts they make with the parents before they come in? You're going to learn this. I'm going to learn this. What are your beliefs on that? Well, I, I'm very really convinced that everybody dies right on time, whether it's okay. six hours, six days, six months or 60 years, right on time. And the time of death is already predetermined before we, uh, we incarnate. Some only have to go to college for maybe six months, some for four years and some even longer. And the, the college time is individual how we or how much time we need. And sometimes we are not only come for our own sake to learn something and clean up our own karma. Sometimes we incarnate for the lesson to give to our parents or friends around us. So a young baby who is only there for three or four months and then dies makes an impact lesson on the parents. The parents will be majorly changed through that experience. And whatever the parents have to learn from this is very, very important. So the child itself, the baby itself, may not necessarily do it for karmic reason. They may come in and incarnate to help the parents, to teach the parents the lesson the parents have to grasp. So yes, everybody dies direct, uh, exactly on time. We have a little bit uh, leeway there. We can make slight little changes through artificial extension, like uh, an, an organ transplantation, which I'm no fa no fan of. I made a video on that one, because uh, the soul of an attached uh, of an organ can move over to the next body. Which I'm let me repeat. Let me start from the beginning. Okay. When we make organ transplantation transplants. Uh, very often, uh, first of all, uh, which is an important um, point because a lot of people about death think about this thing. Um, until recently, until 1960, the definition of death was when the heart stopped beating and the blood was no longer pulsating. That was death. And then in 1968, Christian Barnard at Chote Schuhe Hospital in South Africa made the first heart transplant. Yes, that's right. It really shocked the American uh, and the medical uh, profession because they thought they were much, much better. And so in, they came together in Harvard and made a decision that from now on, death is no longer when the heart stops, but when the brain stops. So the blood and brain, the blood can, the body can still be wonderfully functioning, but the brain stops. Now the soul does not eat the brain. The soul can be still connected to the body through the silver cord all the time. So the, this, there has no, no real death taken place in many cases when the doctor says this person is dr brain dead. 
And then they open up the body because the body has to be still working. There has to be still blood circulation. So they rip the body open, take it out the organs and put it into another human being. Now the soul is watching it, it's feeling the horrible pain because it's connected to the body through the silver cord. And it feels this, oh, and it can't do anything and realize that the body it occupied until just now will no longer be functioning. It then jumps with the organs to the next body and continues living there. And if you, and I, there are several books on this subject of people who have two souls because of organ transplantation. And, and I mentioned them in my video. I can't really recall them, but anybody's interested, watch my video on organ transplantation. And you know, also even, uh, even Alexander, Dr. Even Alexander, he was very popular recently on, on the television. He was a neuroscientist who yes. was a week out in, in, in coma. Under normal condition, he would long, they would have harvested his body, but they didn't. And he came out of the coma and he went to the other world and came back. And he just proved the, uh, if a brain dead does not mean the soul is no longer connected to the body. So there we have a neuroscientist proving it very clearly. And we still do this horrific thing to people. Now we think we do something wonderful by donating our organs to someone else who can use them. And I will not say don't do it because it's, I'm not, I don't want to influence anybody in any way in their choices, but become aware of what you're actually doing. And um, it, it comes also from the belief that this is the only life we are having. Sometimes a person, when college years come to an end, have to move, have to die, have to leave this college. And if we extend it artificially, what are we really gaining here? If we don't really need to be in college, why are we still hanging around here? Now, it's easy for me to say when you don't have a loved one who is maybe waiting for a kidney or something like right. this, I agree that. And I understand that people who are in that situation think that and feel very differently. But I think more information on this subject may help you. And when we see the whole life, the bigness of life, how our earthly life is such a small little facet of who we are and what we go through. Maybe everything becomes in a better perspective and we understand it better and it helps us better also to, to, to see. And what you said so correctly, when a loved one dies, what am I doing with my life? This is my opportunity to now redevelop the love which I gave to the other person, now give it to someone else, to share this love with other people because I don't have to sort of, uh, it's, it's, it's my challenge as well to now become loving. And maybe that's a part the reason why the person died so that I can expand myself. My heart can go bigger and larger. Now, this is not possible right away when somebody dies. I fully understand that it's horrible. It's a dreadful experience and we are attached to this and we are, we are mourning and mm -hmm. it's, there's nothing wrong with this. And it's, it's, it's good to mourn. It's a feeling. We have to be honest with that. But we also, in a way, have to understand that all mourning is only for ourselves. And even that is okay. It's like if somebody suddenly, I lose my legs through an accident, I definitely would be mourning. I'm missing those legs. Sure. It's a natural feeling. And if a partner lives, leaves, it's exactly a major yes. loss. And um, we have to adjust to that. That's true. But it, it has nothing to do with the soul who has left. On the contrary, excessive mourning, of course, as you surely know, and I surely have mentioned it, binds the soul to us and to this world, when in truth that soul has to have their own kind of new path to go, their own new challenges to go. But if we hold on to that soul through uh, our excessive mourning, that soul suffers with us and it wants to go, but it can't because we are clinging on to that soul. So we really have to understand that, that to be let go of the soul because they are now in the new world, in a new land, in a new kind of environment where they have to face a new kind of gross experiences. And holding onto them doesn't happen. We will see them again in a very, in a few hours. That's basically. right. Blink of the eye. Yeah. We're Blink together again. Yes. Yeah. They just left the room a little bit before us. That's all. But uh, I understand when we are in that morning situation, it's very, very, very hard. I mean, I just sort of just the other day, I just got an uh, email from a, a mother whose son committed suicide with 18 mm. and so on. And, 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 and the pain and the suffering and the guilt and so on of the parents, it, it's just enormous. It is just un, unbelievable. And this, this is what we do when we consider suicide, the pain we leave behind. 
is is uh, is and, and and we will feel the pain on the other side. This is uh, in, in case of suicide. I made a video on suicide with all the dynamics because most people are not aware. And and I'm very really, uh, grateful that I got so many emails from people who considered suicide, stumbled on my video, and at least at that time says have not done it. I don't know whether they later on will do, but they were really close to suicide. And after seeing the video, and the, what we uh, what will happen to the soul after the suicide, they are no longer um, ready to do that. And uh, so that is really very helpful. When we understand this whole concept of life before birth and how we plan our incarnation here on earth, and also after what happens when after we die, that is uh, then everything here on in our life shifts because we see it differently, we experience different. we experience people differently, we see it from a different perspective, and the compassion grows tremendously because you, you see so many people being very confused and very limited in their thinking, this is their only life, they have to squeeze everything in, they're attached to everything, and they attach very much to possessions because yes. that is a form of, of oh, maybe I can live longer. And uh, so you see this, and uh, anyway, it, it's just a very, um, very important step, I think, for us to explore why we are here. The first question you ask in this uh, interview. It's a great conversation. I love listening. A uh, couple things. One, I am an organ donor, <laughs> and uh, I, I don't know. I think that's that's a decision. Like everybody has to look in their heart and. Uh, well, I might change it that at some point, um, my instinct and my love is service. And I'm going to stick with that for a little bit. But yeah. Also, yeah, yeah, I think, you know, it, what's really interesting is, and I'm sure you've felt the same way with all the investigation you've done over 50 years. Um, there's things that really resonate with our soul, you know, and, and we have to look at that, you know, honor that. Absolutely. And then also something you said is talking about grief. I know on a personal level, um, without my father dying the way he did, and what I learned about, like I channeled or funneled my energy onto doing research about grief, writing my book, sharing. There's mm -hmm. another great organization with so many members called HelpingParentsHeal.org, and it's mm -hmm. for parents who have lost a child. But they have funneled their grief into coming together and creating programs and online programs and videos and they have guest speakers um and and those people wouldn't be involved had they had their children not departed this life the way it is so we can use our grief and yes. use the power and actually be of service. I absolutely love your forgiveness, love and service. I think those are definitely three common denominators that <laughs> any one of us can look at those three words. And if we're on track in life, those three things are part of our lives. So really, thank you for those words. And the, the, the suffering or the pain you experience through your grief made you the compassionate person you are. That's true. We can't, we can't become compassionate intellectually. We really have to sometimes feel the pain to realize, oh, this is how it feels. Now I know. And therefore, all the kind of the obstacles we had in our life and the difficulties in our life are a blessing always because they really bring us a closer step closer to who we truly are. We are unconditional, unlimited and all inclusive love. That is our default existence. And the more we come from most of, and we have two ways to learn this. We become this either through pain or through insight. Hmm. We can do it through pain when we ignore the law of karma, the law of cause and effect, and etc., the causal law. Uh, or we can learn and say, oh my God, this is the way, I better watch out here, I better to really do this. And we can do it through insight. Majority of people in the world, unfortunately, learns through pain. That's why we go to from war to war to war mm -hmm. until we finally exhaust ourselves. But we don't need to do that. We can go through inside. We have all these wonderful, wonderful teachings from so many sources and from so many. Uh, well, even you, even you can <clears throat> take the basic thing of the Bible. <clears throat> Although there's a lot of contradiction, and I'm not in favor of, of a, a lot of stuff which is in it. Mm -hmm. But the basic thing, the Ten Commandments and the Sermon on the Mount, that's all you need. And the Golden Rule. 
These three things in life, you don't need anything else. But the golden rule is in all traditions, it's in all cultures, and we have it everywhere. And so we do have these guiding things in our life. We also have something very important, you and I, everybody has, which we ignore, unfortunately, too often. Oh, I ignore. Maybe I shouldn't generalize. Maybe you are better than that. No, I probably not. What is it? <laughs> it is our conscience. Yes. The little voice in us. That's right. The little right. voice which don't do it, don't do it, stop here, stop here, etc. Or and they do it or go ahead and touch and so on. This little voice is our is our GPS system in a way. Yes. And um, we don't really giving it honor it enough. Or most people, I, I'm not, I'm, again, I shouldn't generalize, but I wish I had listened more in my life about this little voice. And um, so we do have all these tools. We are not lost here. We have got also our guardian spirit. I made a video on the guardian spirit. It's with us all the time. They cannot fight against our will. We have always our free will, mm -hmm. but they can direct us a little bit and can give help us and tell us, do we really want to do this, etc. So there's a lot of help there as well. Can we talk about that a little bit? I mean, is it something where we ask for help from our guardians, guardian <laughs> angels, whoever, our guides? Well, I tell you, when it comes to asking for help, I always believe, why not go straight to the, uh, to the source? I mean, uh, people say, Can, shall I pray to Mary, Mary for help, or et cetera, et cetera, Just, uh, or to the Pope or whatever it is. No, go right to God. And for me, this is the simple thing, basically in meditation or in prayer, and you understand, I, I understand from my understanding, and I'm not, and again, I'm, whatever I do my videos, I merely offer. I do not try to convince anybody, and anybody who doesn't believe or can't handle it, it's fine with me. I have sure. no... Share, I do the same thing with these conversations. I share what I know right. as my and, truths, and people, yeah, yeah, no, like this guy, don't like this one, you know, and that's fine. Take the gold for your life and all of them. So same thing with your videos. So I would go directly to God. And in my really true, honest prayer, where I really, uh, uh, from the, even if God knows everything with me, but I can, I have to verbalize it, what it is, what gives me pain, I verbalize it either loud, which is always a good idea in a prayer, if you can do, or even quiet, but really explain and says, you need some help here, some guidance, not to, for him to fix it or her to fix it, the mother, father, God, I want, don't want to be here, <clears throat> only one sex only, it's got both, but um I don't want them necessarily to fix it, or if it is as in thy will. The p most powerful words we have are given in the days, thy will be done. When we surrender to these words in every situation we are, and we really believe that there is a power stronger than myself who knows far more what is right for me or wrong, no, not good for me, and I surrender to that power to lead my way according to thy will, to God's will, this total surrender gives tremendous peace, gives tremendous security. Then we don't, our ego does, is, cuts out and says, oh, I must have this job, or I must have this one, etc." No, I surrender. says, look, I ask for the very best for, for me. And if it's a job or a new house or a new car or even loss of job or whatever it is, whatever it is, I now trust it is in, the, in, uh, in God's hand to do so. So... If that is too abstract for people, and it, I understand that there is also, of course, uh, Christ. You can also ask Christ, which is the same love energy, or uh, the guardian angel as well, in a way that you can confine, like a good bro big brother. You confine with, uh, to the guardian angel if you want to in, in a prayer, and uh, close your eyes and you quietly sit down, imagine the guardian uh, angel be in close to you, and ask them, tell me, what do I need to know now? What is it that I need to know now? Now, some people hear voices, some people have say, it's say to get an idea, whatever it is. Some people do nothing, but something during the day may come up and so on. So we can have definitely connection with, with, with the spiritual world. And I believe that is another often forgotten positive element when a loved one dies. Because when we are in a close relationship, we have limited, we take usually limited time for communicating with the divine. Once that person is no longer there, we have got suddenly enormous open space on time and energy. And that is our opportunity to connect with divinity. That is the powerful thing. That is in a way the gift death of another person does to us, that we suddenly are alone again for a while. And I also believe that always people who are alone, uh, adult people who always crave for having a partner, wanting a partner, fully understandable. 
And I've been there as well on both sides, single and so on. But when I was single for many years before uh, I, I got married and so on, that was a time when I had by far the closest connection with divinity. I could meditate when I want. I can't be there. I had the feeling my meditations were much, much deeper. The moment when I was in a relationship again, life shifted in, uh, for me. And the attention, the thinking of another person, etc., cetera, uh, became very, very different. The priorities seemed to be shifting. So again, when a loved one leaves us, somebody who very close to us, it opens up for God. It's another opportunity to come close to love. Mm, beautiful. And I love that you say, thy will be done surrender, trust, listen to our own consciousness, that little voice. Sometimes I, if I have a a big problem or question, I imagine these big hands, and in my mind, that's God's hands, and I say, I just have to put this in your hands. And it's really interesting, because I, I don't pray that much, I'm, I'm thinking. But when I have, the answers have come, or there's been these strange synchronicities that the answers come or the persons come or something. And so for me personally, I'm going to do more prayer and pay attention because I, it's so easy. And this is the next thing I want to ask you about. So easy to get lost in my own head with thoughts. And I'm always thinking about the past or very often the future. I've got the little voice in my head that says I can't do it or I'm not good enough or I'm not smart enough. And I think I call that the ego. I don't know if that's what you call it. But do you have any words of advice on the little voice in our head that might not be our best champion? And, you know, any thoughts about, you know, thinking about the past or the future and, you know, how we can, I mean, not necessarily control this mind, but what it what it is and the monkey mind. The monkey the, mind swinging from branch to branch. Fast, 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 fast. Okay. Yeah, no. Let me just get uh, no, what you said earlier about um, uh, no, when, you, um, when you are open to hear advice or guidance and you see the guidance around you. The thing is that the guidance is coming from us all the time. Life is nothing else than communication, the sending and giving all the time. Everything around us speaks to us nonstop. It's only when, we, as you said, when I finally sit down and that's all. No, maybe I give it to God. I give it hands. Then you suddenly open yourself up to the signs which have been coming all the time. Interesting. So it's not that God suddenly does it only because you ask Him. It's there all the time. And I give you a typical example. But what happens always? What I often do is suddenly go into nature and close your eyes or, or look at a tree. And ask the tr look at the tree without any freedom of this and see whether you get a message from a tree. And the tree can be giving a message, basically the outside world, and I made a video on this, this is the law of projection. It's nothing else than a mirror of what goes on within ourselves. So in the tree, we suddenly see the, the problem, the drama, and what our own life, and we find answers in this one. The outside world is nothing than a mirror, and we can see ourselves in the outside world. Whatever bothers us in the outside world is something that we have not loved in ourselves. So I would really say just to, to calm down. For me, of course, the meditations are always very, very important. I have to do that once or twice a day to really calm myself down, to go into a short prayer or whatever it is, and what if you can, if you live alone, it's much easier. Speak loud with your whoever you are close to, whether it's God, Christ, guardian angels. Speak loud with have a communication with them. Don't be afraid that they lock you up and <laughs> come the little white man come and lock you up. Because, no, it is a, a, a powerful tool to have that communication because out of this communication you get also the answers by verbalizing you also get the answers back to the verbalization. And you're also focusing on what is really at the moment at heart for what you are doing. And it helps to clarification. So I personally feel that even a loud communication with divinity is a wonderful tool. And you're not necessarily in prayers or sit down, but just as you are doing the dishes and whatever it is, it is something which I think is, is, is it has helped me tremendously to stay focused and come and I just feel, because I know there is all this energy around me. As I'm sitting here, I know I'm surrounded by this energy. And uh, I'm not a channel. I can't channel through them. And I'm blessed that I don't do it. <laughs> but oh, it's there. 
Um, but and I have it throughout the day wherever I am. I have this feeling, and when you have this feeling that you are never ever alone, it is so rewarding. It is so much strength come from it because then you don't have to do it on your own anymore. What you said earlier, I'm not good enough. I can't do this, etc. There's nothing you have to do on your own. You can do it always with the biggest power, the greatest power there is. Um, and I, that's from my experience there. It's always available. It's just only that we try to do it our own. We think we have to do it our own. And uh -uh, it doesn't always work the way. We can, we can get uh, our own goals achieved. But when we do it together with a much stronger force, it's really, really so much more fun. And we never feel alone. The, I think one of the biggest problems we have in life is the feeling of loneliness. And I made a video on yes. that one as well. Um, the loneliness really uh, is is uh, is driving people crazy and to drugs or whatever it is because people can't cope with loneliness. And again, loneliness can be a blessing. It can be a blessing for us to realize who we are and that we are not alone and what this whole thing is all about. So everything has a positive side as well if we just look at it. Hmm. I, I'm thinking in my mind how people often say, don't call them problems, call them opportunities. When we look at those things, we might call it loneliness or a problem or whatever, but if we just shift and think, you know, this is an opportunity for growth or an opportunity for a new friend or an opportunity to connect with the divine. Yeah. I made See a video on life before birth, before we come here. There, before we come here to this earth, <clears throat> we are guided by our guardian spirit or by, by uh, highly evolved uh, angelic beings. And they show us more or less how our life here on earth will be. They show us, and I make these, I take an example of a riverbed, you know, with ups and downs. With, 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 uh, yes, I've uh, seen this video, yeah. So, and we know in advance when there will be difficult times, when we are teenager, when we are 35, when we are 65, there will be these major kind of impacts. And we also make agreements, contracts, as you said earlier, with other souls who will come at that time into our life and give us help. Mm. and give us a difficult situation so that we grow. So these angels are, who we see on earth think they are devils or they're horrible people, are nobody else but coming into our life to, for us to wake up, to grow. So we know in advance before we incarnate what more or less we expect. It's not in detail, it's a rough outline. And then here on earth, of course, we forget that. And then we face the, uh, face, uh, the situations and the reason people said, yeah, if that is true, why are we forgetting all this stuff? I mean, why do we have the veil of forgetfulness the moment we incarnate? And the reason is also very simple. When, for instance, if I have a, a very bad relationship with my mother, for instance, a real difficult one, a really, we really hate each other, etc. And I suddenly understand intellectually, remember, oh, I made a deal that I should love her. Then I go out and start loving her because of this intellectual decision. It doesn't work on the soul level. The wanting to love her has to come from me without knowing that she is my challenge. It has to come from my heart, not from my head. Yes. If our decision comes from my head, it has very little effect. It has to be says, I think I did enough painful with my mother. I think I tried in a different way. I will do it now lovingly. That works. And that's the reason why we forget all the difficulties which we have agreed to prior our incarnation. Oh, that's beautifully said. And I also think I had asked you the question about that little voice in our head that's not always so great. I think that's in place so that we do forget who we really are and we do learn these lessons. Yeah, this is, 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 is loud. This is our ego. I made a video on the ego of what uh, it's our identification with our body. I love your videos. Let me just tell you that. And now that you've mentioned some that I haven't seen, it's like, oh, I'll be spending more time. So, yeah, when I checked yesterday, it was over 57,000 um, followers. You have subscribers on your page, and you're going to get a whole bunch more after this <laughs> and add an extra one for me. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Sandra. Yeah, it's a great pleasure. Yeah, anyway, it's just, I, I like to, I like, I mean, as I said earlier, I merely offer it. If it doesn't work, that's absolutely fine because it, uh, not everybody needs to know that. Everybody has got their own reasons, they have their own classes. That's why all we go to different colleges when we all have different classes in college and we all have different conceptions. Everybody has an individual path. And the same applies coming back to the subject of why we are here about death. 
There may be sort of 10 major points which happen for most souls when they leave, but still everybody dies individually and the death experience is also very, very individual, even on the other side, according to the development of the soul and what the soul has to learn. There isn't one fits all. It really has to do so much about the purpose of the person's life, etc., and and their beliefs, etc., which determines what happens to the soul on the other side. I'd like to ask, you had said earlier uh, what your father had said through the medium to write a book to get the words out there because there are confused souls that arrive. The video that you have, the 10 surprises when you die, is that including some of those words you spoke to your father? Or would you, I mean, I, I think many of us are going to go right to your <laughs> YouTube well, channel and watch some of these, but what well, kind of things should we know when we <laughs> arrive I can list them more or less quickly. But yeah, yeah, that's if, I, if you don't I, mind. I can't remember exactly what I said. Oh, this that's okay. Later, by my father, I don't know exactly what I told him, but I knew exactly how I believe, uh, how uh, for the most people death will be, and I think that's it's probably more or less what I said to him. So the points are very. The first thing, of course, when people on the other side, when the silver cord which connects us to the physical body is cut, uh, and we are basically what we call dead, physical death is that there is no such thing like death. We will continue living. I think that's the most surprise for many people who didn't expect that. That's right. And then comes it also the second surprise is that we still have a body. Um, a body is a different body. This is made of spiritual particles, but it is still a body. Very often looking similar like the one we had before and even a bit younger and so on. But we still have a physical body. And then the next thing is that we can't hide anything from anybody. This is our spiritual garment. Our spiritual garment is like our aura, which shows everything of who we are. And that is totally visible in the spiritual realm because we no longer have the physical body which can hide it. So we can't hide anything. We are who we are. This is it. The next thing is, of course, that our characters, our personality, our opinions, and most of all, our our beliefs are still completely intact. As you said earlier, people do not change to the position of death. If we are sort of a fanatic, whatever it is, you are a fanatic on the other side too, in your beliefs, and your behavior. And if you're stupid in this lifetime, you're know, slightly stupid on the other side too for a long time because you know, your education continues there. Right. And uh, so, as you said correctly, and so on, if you really want to connect, uh, reconnect with your uncle, make sure he is a wise guy <laughs> here on earth before you listen to him on the other side. That's you know? right. That's right. They don't have all the answers. <laughs> and the, uh, what, is, uh, what is also very, very important is that with our death, we take with us all our habits and all our cravings and our addictions. Whatever we were at very attached here in this life to, it can be drugs, it can be smoke, it can be alcohol, it can also be possessions, it can also be our addiction to persons. All this kind, what we, what, what we are strongly attached to, the craving we need to identify with, that craving and this attachment we bring into the other world, which can be very, very painful, particularly for physical addiction like drugs and so on, because suddenly we no longer have the physical body to take that in which again is another subject of uh, spirit possessions. Or in, uh, in my video, Death Part 2, I explain the so-called earthbound souls. So that's another point. Then, of course, um, we also realize on the other side that all our pursuits we had here on Earth are actually unimportant. All the stuff, our achievements, our status, career, collecting stuff, fame, recognition, doesn't count on the other side. What really counts is love, forgiveness, and being of service. Beautiful. And so then we further, oh my gosh, I basically lived this life totally wrong. And then the other thing is that usually we see beings of light, also we call them angels, who are welcoming us and want to guide us to the next level of uh, wherever we have to be. So we have got these guidance. And we can also, the next thing is also that we can be greeted by loved ones, by former spouses and children or parents and so on, to really make the transition uh, easier. And... Um, then we also may be surprised that the world we find finally land in for many of us may not look that different than what we left behind. It's a very similar uh, uh, kind of environment for, for many, many souls than here we had here on Earth. Um, not all of them, but many are surprised that, and that it is so similar. 
And the, I think the biggest surprise in the end for those who are strong uh, kind of fanatic believers is there is no eternal hell, there is no damnation, and there is no final judgment day. All these things are made up concepts from the, from the church organizations. So that is also not there. So this is basically the other surprises which we have. Now, everybody dies differently. There are also souls who have really a very unfortunate life. They have been thieves you know, under a very negative life and so on. They may be pulled right away into a realm of similar vibration, of similar kind of entities and so on, for them to grow slowly out of, which is not hell in a sense of eternal hell, but it can be a very painful way. And uh, uh, that is where the soul still has to purify itself because it hasn't really lived by the law of love, but only by the law of selfishness and greed and whatever it may be. So this is just only a very broad description of what happens for most souls. And there is still always the individual chance that it goes very, very different. Right. And it is nice to know there's help on the other side as well and guidance and we continue to grow and learn. But with all your interviews done, I'm sure you have got some other points which you would add to that or not? Uh, I think those are good. And I'm just, not that I don't want to add anything, but I'm just being a little aware of time. And there's something I don't want to forget to ask you because I have a beautiful book in my hands and I want to talk to you a little bit about your books. Mm. Uh, for our listener, if you go to I, Am- even on Amazon and you type in Hans Wilhelm, I picked up a book called I'll Always Love You, and it's a child's book with such a beautiful message. And just looking at the books that I have seen available, they all seem to me written of really great messages. Could you talk a little bit about your books? Thank you so much. That book particularly came through a visit, a meeting with Dr. Kubler-Ross. Oh, wonderful. Um, at the time, and um, the message in this book is basically saying, I will, I love you to everybody and we know in our family and so on. And her message at that time was so very clearly, it says, any excessive mourning or grieving is nothing but undeclared love. A person who thinks he or she has not verbally said to the person, I love you, is the one who grieves longest. I found this very powerful, and this is the reason why I made this book. It is so important to say these words, I love you, to our to the people who are close to us and who we really love. Don't assume it, because not verbalizing can create this tremendous extension of, 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 of grief. And and uh, that I found it powerful. That was a, that was a reason why I created that book, which is also based on a true story. It was my dog I have in there, but I made it a little bit in the in the direction of of, of Kubler Ross. I made a lot of books, and I also wrote a lot of books for adults together with Byron Katie. Some people of your listeners may yes, know Byron. Katie. Definitely. And uh, we worked together on several books together, and that was very rewarding. And then a lot of my children's books have got uh, some spiritual element, but usually very nicely covered because uh, we can't be too open with that, uh, uh, with a spiritual aspect in the children's book market. It just must be more fun and more maybe different, but it's usually hidden there somewhere in there. Well, I know the best way I learn is through stories. Yeah. And you tell the stories and you get the message. So I, just looking at the titles, I I just think, even one, Let's Be Friends Again, I haven't read that one, but I can tell by the title what the message is going to be. And even there's one about courage. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, do you have any words about courage? Just, that's always something I deal with is fear. I think that's part of being human, but. Out of the blue, I mean, you have a very courageous life and what you're doing and your your day job and so on. I know, it seems it, but I have issues I struggle with as well, and it always seems like fear rears its head. And yeah, Mm -hmm. I'm not the mastery of being being human, um, but I certainly am one of those people that share what I know and and love to share and serve. Right. Yeah. I don't know. I can't, can't, can't put it into a one sentence and so on. I think courage comes also from trust. You just mustn't, uh, I, for, my, for myself, speaking for myself, I just know that I'm not alone. I know that there is some energy and I have a very personal di- a connection with, with these, uh, with God, Christ and God is will, that everything is possible if it needs to be done. And I just leave it, put it into their hand and it, I, I make them my co-worker. 
That doesn't mean that everything I make is, 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 is divinely inspired. On the contrary, I make a lot of crap, a lot of <laughs> bad mistakes. <laughs> You're but funny. <laughs> as I started and as I do it, I come with a, a, a hope that it may be blessed and have the blessings of these energies. And uh, that to, then I'm never alone. I don't do it uh, alone. This, this helps me. That's basically it. But then I don't have to wait for other people to approve it, which is also very, very important. I think our yes. search for approval is probably the most most uh, annoying thing we have, uh, that we can really live without anybody's approval, appreciation, and, 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 and acknowledgement. Yes. But knowing that we have the other side with us just sort of reduces that for a, for a large percentage, oh, for a beautiful. large degree. Well, we just have a few minutes left. Is there a question I should have asked you or something you else you would like to share or dig deep down into just any closing words you may have? Sandra, no, I don't think anything comes up at the moment. I think I spoke a lot. and uh, Oh, this is packed with good stuff. <laughs> packed with good stuff. Yeah. As I said, I only offer it, uh, make up your own mind and uh, follow your own bliss and your own way and your own way of doing it. And uh, But if you find some information here and there which may help you to clarify certain things, it can be such a relief. It was always for me, whenever I met one of the teachers or I read a book or whatever, all the teachers I had throughout my life, they really made me larger. They made me bigger. And I'm sure you have the same thing when you interview people. And so every time you, you learn something new, it widens your scope, your understanding, yes. your appreciation of life. So um, it's, it's, we have so many choices. We can really, you know, I tell you what, what I found interesting is that somebody sent it to me. I don't get them all together. But it says, do you know that the seven deadly sins, you have heard about them, there's a gluttony and, 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 and et cetera, you know, yes. and, and greed and loss. They all have an app. So we all can actually, this, uh, the gluttony, I just comes, I hope I get them together, but I don't know. Gluttony is a Yelp. Um, in, um, in, uh, uh, the Facebook is, uh, in, uh, is, is, is uh, vanity. Um, in, uh, Twitter is hate. Um, oh gosh, no, in a sex or in a diet is, is Tinder. Um, oh, uh, I, I, there are two, um, two missing. I don't get it. But the fact is, it was very easy. When you see this, we have so many opportune distractions at the moment, which we didn't have 50 years ago, whatever it is. At the moment, at your fingertip, you can immediately be in a different world. According, fulfilling all your pleasures, all your joys, or whatever it is for the moment. You're wasting your life, of course, this way, and we all do that to a degree. Netflix is the other one. It's sloth, by the way. And so we all have these tremendous temptations around us, and it's helpful to stay and find some channels like yours to really refresh our, to, 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 uh, to nurture our soul, because there is the other stuff out there. Yes. And you have to make a decision. Do I want the other stuff? Or do I want to nurture my soul? Mm. And I do think there's a way to nurture your soul with some of those things you mentioned, especially if you look at it from forgiveness, oh. love, and service. Because um, yeah. I know, for one, there's so many people I can reach more, you know, if they see a post on forgiveness or something like that on Facebook yeah. than, than would be. So that's another that we all yeah. look at. But it's funny how they can be just the opposite and a huge distraction and yeah. time waster. And there's one thing I've heard so many people say uh, that even a heart surgeon said when people, before they give them the anesthesia to put them under the knife, you know, for whatever surgery. He says, people have so many regrets and they look back at the things that they should have done or should have said. And I think using like videos like yours and the books and things, if we can get people, myself included, to start looking through the eyes of forgiveness and love and trust and listening to our consciousness and being of service, that we kind of handle and deal with these things during our lifetime so that when we look back in those maybe those final moments sure there's always things we could have done but you know that you've said the i love you's you know that you've forgiven you know you've been the best you can be and i think um i, I want to really thank you also for your videos because yes sometimes we learn big lessons over the course of our lives but i also know that you can watch a video of yours whether it's three four seven minutes long and you can get just a great amount of like a jump for the soul on education and and you can start looking at these things uh, 
in they're all refreshed. Yeah. Uh, what is in my videos? My oh, your soul knows. This is the thing. I'm only showing what the soul knows of it. There's nothing new. <laughs> and we just need the reminder. Well, Hans, yeah. thank you for being our guest today. Thank you. I'm I'm absolutely delighted, Sandra. It was a great joy and nice meeting you, speaking with you, and I wish you all the best with your book and with your series. And oh, with thank you thank so much, and ditto to you. Uh, thank you from the bottom of my heart, all of our hearts, for your life's love and taking the time and creating this because there's a reason there's 57,000 people watching your videos they're just extraordinary and that you've you've been obviously a busy man with 200 books and everything else you're doing and and to create these so thank you for that labor of love really uh, and for our listener, thank you for spending this last hour with us. As a reminder, you can visit Hans on his websites, Hans uh, Wilhelm, or Wilhelm, but with the W, dot com, and uh, www.lifeexplained.com. And then just beneath this episode, there's a live link to his YouTube channel and also to his books on Amazon. I have that included as well because they're just extraordinary. And I think to while these books are children's books, why not, when those minds are young, teach them lessons of love and compassion and service and all of those things just by word of stories? Absolutely beautiful. I want to. Oh, go ahead, Hans. No, thank you. Just oh, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> you're most welcome. And also, just a reminder our home base is we don't die radio.com, where you can now find over 260 episodes. And all kinds of free gifts when you go to the website, we don't die radio.com. And as a reminder, I always like to promote my friends with the Afterlife Symposium, which will be September 13th through 16th in Scottsdale, Arizona. There are now 33 speakers that talk about what we love most evidence of the afterlife. Um, help through grief, help to have a powerful life. And you can go to afterlifesymposium.org to find out more and to register. So in closing, my name is Sandra Champlain, and I'm always so grateful and delighted that I get to be your host on We Don't Die Radio. I do believe that life is an education for the soul and that your life here on earth is important. And what I'm really looking at for myself is looking at life through the eyes of forgiveness, love, and service and not to forget thy will be done um, the most powerful words han said we can surrender we can trust you can visualize those big hands uh you can and then listen to your consciousness and i absolutely love that the everything is always coming to us you know we just need to quiet down to listen or go to a tree for the answer just absolutely beautiful so i want to thank you for listening and we'll see you soon mm -hmm.